Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The County Seat. I'm your host, Chad Boot. I have a question for you. Do your kids know where food comes from? If they answer the store, then they are part of a growing trend of disconnect between our food supply and the consumer. If they answered ranch and the farm, then they're still in the loop. While food has become disconnected from its source as far as our daily lives go, it has become much safer thanks to inspection programs operated in Utah by the Utah Department of Food and Agriculture, along with the USDA. That stamp of approval means that you no longer are buying these products at your own risk. And with a stamp of approval on the coming story, let's find out about it from Don Dunwell. We rarely worry about the safety of the food that we buy and put on the table. With modern refrigeration and proper cooking techniques, there are fewer foodborne illness outbreaks than we've seen in decades past. But there's a part of the equation that you probably don't even know about. And it happens long before you pick up that steak at your local grocery store. That meat inspection was started out to begin with is to protect people from getting animal carcass or animal tissues that were unfit for human consumption that could cause either illness or death. The reason it's so important is because we're the first line of defense basically in the food chain for people protecting their food supply from things that would be harmful to them or their family. The first meat inspection rules were passed by Congress in 1906 to ensure that meat products were safe for consumption. These laws were meant to ensure that slaughter and meat processing were done under sanitary conditions. In 1967, the state of Utah formed a cooperative working agreement with the U.S. Department of Agriculture allowing for an official meat inspection program within the state. USDA and our people are all trained the same. We're all certified by USDA. We have to be equal to them in order to have our own state program. And so all of the things that USDA requires, we do require in the state of Utah. Our product is just as wholesome and good as, as the federal. The difference is, is state uh, establishments can't ship interstate or over state lines. Even though the state and federal meat inspection guidelines are the same, there's a good reason both are in place side by side. Having dealt with the federal government, uh, they have a tendency to not be as close to the people, as close to the people that they're serving, and because of that, from time to time, there's misunderstandings that cause difficulty for smaller establishments to remain in business, whereas we are more close to them. Uh, local government has a tendency to be a little more inclined to listen to the the problems of the others and try to resolve it on an individual basis where it can be resolved that way. The inspection process involves 31 steps that first start with the live animal and follow the carcass through the entire packing process. In order to make a proper disposition or diagnosis on that product, it requires an empirical look at everything. And that includes what was seen while that animal was alive. If any sign of problems or abnormalities are found, a veterinarian is called in to determine whether the carcass must be removed from the food chain. The mission of meat inspection is with the consumer in mind. And that is so that when that consumer picks up a package of, of a meat product and it says inspected and passed, that they can be assured that that is a wholesome, nutritious, and most importantly, tasty product. Meat inspection is a seamless process that happens in the background, but is a key component in keeping the families of Utah healthy and safe. For the county seat, I'm Don Dunwell. Thanks, Don, for that report. When we come back, we will continue our conversation about meat processing in Utah and the broader impacts of cattle on the communities across the state. Stay with us. We'll be back with the county seat in just a moment. Landscapes as diverse as the people who venture to find them await.
All you have to do is find a place to begin. Moab, Utah, in Grand County, where adventure begins. Along Interstate 70 and Highway 89 is an area that is rich with high mountain peaks, vast forests, lakes, streams, historical sites, and a climate that is perfect for outdoor adventures, no matter what the season. Whether you visit Sevier County to catch one of the many celebrations, experience a country-style county fair, or be part of various concerts, sports, or equestrian events, you will be greeted by local residents with a smile and a welcoming hand. In the center of it all, Sevier County. I lived in Phoenix and then down in Orange County in California and I met a small town girl and she brought me home. Just the smaller community that makes you feel like when you go somewhere you know everybody. You know, the sporting programs, the uh, dance events, all these kinds of things you run into people you know and that, that care about you and your family. And that makes it just a wonderful place to have little ones like this. Isn't it time you found the balance you've been looking for? You went to County, Utah. Welcome back to the County Seat. Our topic today is the meat processing industry in the state of Utah, the impacts it has on local economies, the state economy, and on your dinner table. Joining us for our conversation, Randy Parker, the CEO of the Utah Farm Bureau Federation. We have Russell Holt, who is the Assistant Manager of Meat and Poultry for uh, inspection for the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food, and Della Fever, who is a Garfield County Commissioner and a cattle rancher in Garfield and Kane County. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And Del, I see you came complete with your genuine cowboy hat. I've got my Sunday best on. <laughs> I would like to start the conversation by just uh, talking a little bit about um, the ranching process, from, from ranching to processing plants, and talk about the economic benefit of ranching and grazing in the state of Utah. Well, uh, agriculture is a big part of the Utah economy. When you figure uh, Utah food and agriculture contributes about $17 billion to the, to the state's economy, that's about 14% of the total GDP. Livestock uh, and the cattle industry make up about one third of that. It's our largest single sector of, of the agriculture economy. When, when you drill that down to ranches in, yeah, out in, in rural Utah, uh, a 500 cow uh, mama cow calf operation will contribute about a million dollars based on today's cattle prices. Cattle prices are up and that, that has to do a lot with the inventory of cattle out there across the country. We're at a 60 year low right now uh, and we can talk more about why we're there. But, but the reality is cattle prices are up and so that 500 cow, cow calf operation will contribute in the neighborhood of a million dollars to the local economy. Dell, how does that affect you, uh, you know, the impact on, let's say your county, you know, where it's a third, a, a third of the entire aggregate for the food processing across the state or, or agriculture or industry. Is it a bigger number in a county like Garfield? It, well, for Garfield, See, all we have left is agriculture and tourism. And uh, tourism is a seasonal thing. Where agriculture, we're there the year round. So you, you take, uh, take a thousand cows out of Garfield County, it's hurting the economy big time. Because that's, somebody's not taking care of the cows, that fuel you're not buying, that tires you're not buying, you're, you're, you're not spending money if you don't have the cows. But if you've got the cows, you've got money to spend. And that's what keeps the local economy going. That's what keeps the service stations, the little cafes in these towns in the wintertime. That's all they have is agriculture to keep them going. You got the federal government, but it's it's a different different game. You know, it's but we're take my outfit, I got four dually trucks running seven days a week. And so you're spending money in town to keep your cow outfit going. And so every every cow that's in that county just adds to the value of the, the county budget. So, Russell, I'd like to ask you a question uh, because when we look at the table end of this, uh, these guys are talking about the field production end, 
But on the table end of it, there's both the Utah Department of Food and Agriculture. There's also the USDA. Uh, how do you, what is your relationship? How do you work? Do, uh, do they supersede you? Do you work side by side? The way this was set up uh, is we have to be classified as equal to the federal in order to have our own state meat inspection program. The state meat inspection program was started in the state of Utah in 1967 and since then have gone through several different changes, but we by statute uh, incorporate all of the federal regulations. So there's no difference between what we expect as a state program than what the federal expect. The main difference is if it's a state inspected facility, they can only sell their product within the state of Utah. We do have a program called the Tommy Jakin program that is manned by state inspection people, but they use a federal inspection legend that allows them to ship across state lines or to even export outside the, the state of Utah or the United States. From a statutory in-state, you're considered equals. Do you consider them equals as departments? They're, they probably are equal, but I, I just don't like all the federal regulations they have in the meat industry. Well, do you think that is for meat safety or to harass the ranchers? I think it's to harass the ranchers. Well, and, and, and let's go there just a little bit <laughs> okay, since it's been opened it. up, Chad. Uh, if you look at Utah, ca the cattle numbers in Utah over the last decade, since 2002, we've lost 120,000 head of cattle on the inventory. We're down from 920,000 uh, uh, mama cows on, in our inventory to about 800,000 over a decade. If you take that number that I told you about 500 head of cattle uh, contributing a million dollars, we're, we're talking about almost uh, 200 million dollars that's been pulled out of the rural economies of the state. And I would argue that a lot of that has to do with heavy handed regulations on the farms, on, the gra on, on our grazing permits. People are just throwing their hands in the air and saying, hey, it's not worth it. We're losing. Now let's take that to the consumer. We're seeing three and four dollar a pound hamburger now, which uh, a decade ago was about a, a buck to a buck and a half. Our inventory, these numbers, and government regulation at the meat counter is costing the consumer more, Chad. How much more is that as far as, as the inspection and processing? Uh, is, is it harder to be a USDA certified meat processing plant than a state certified? No. There's, there's no difference. We require the same level of sanitation. We require the same level of sampling uh, to protect the consumer for pathogens such as E. coli 157 and the other six which are called STEC, as well as salmonella uh, in the poultry, things like Campylobacter and so on. Uh, we, our regulations are no less stringent than are the federal. I think the advantage we have is we're closer to the people we understand the things that they're facing, and I think that we do a little better job than the federal because we want these people to be in business. And we do everything we can within the scope of the regulations to see to it that they are in business, that they contribute not only the economy, but the amount of people that work for them. In 2000, there were about 2,100 employees in the state of Utah that were involved in meat processing, either the slaughtering end of it, uh, in 2013, in November, we had about 3,300. So we get about a 60% growth in that period of time in employment, which adds back to the economy. Mr. Lefebvre was talking about tires and gas and so on. We're talking about people that go to work in the meat industry that take a paycheck home that enables them not only to help in all aspects of the economy because they're spending that paycheck to support their family. Let's say you, you put a baby cow on the ground to the time uh, that crop turns into uh, a, a product on the shelf. Do you, do you know about Dell? Okay, I, <clears throat> I, I calve the 1st of March, and I sell the bulk of my calves the 1st of February. But the big ones I go to the feedlot with, or the last while I've been going to the feedlot with them. Uh, but, so I, I'm turning mine over within them calves within six, seven months. You know, I mean, I'm turning my calves. But kill cows, uh, they're just old cows that just don't produce anymore. But I have to send them to Texas to get a decent check out of them, other than run them through the auction. Right now, the auction's are high on kill cows, you're okay. But normally, I have to ship my kill cows to Hereford, Texas for slaughter. And uh, so, but a lot of these calves, I keep them a year before I sell them. So I've got a year into these calves 
where I sell them. Right now, I, I just sold a bunch. It was uh, barned in March, April, May. I just shipped them. Well, I'll ship them tomorrow. And, and they go to where? These, I don't know where these calves went, but they'll go to a feedlot somewhere. And then they'll be then bulked they, up? Yeah, and then they'll, they'll be, be slaughtered. Okay. Well, stay with us. We'll be right back with more of the county seat. A very interesting conversation on the cattle industry, meat processing, and the standards and safeguards we take here in the state of Utah. We'll be right back. ATV, check. Four-wheel driving, check. Bouldering, check. Mountain biking, check. Hiking, check. River rafting, check. Adventure is about more than just crossing activities off of a list, but hey, if you can find a place that gives you everything you're looking for, all the better. In Emory County, you'll find the San Rafael Swell, trails, lakes, and the small town hospitality you're looking for. San Rafael Country, in the heart of Utah. Visit us and check something off your list. Color, it's something that can be seen. But have you ever wanted to reach out and touch it? Experience it. In San Juan County, Utah color comes to life like nowhere else on earth. Color can be more than an abstract. Color can be your gateway to a new world. Visit San Juan County and explore the past, present, and future in a way that you've only dreamed of. San Juan County. Color. Your experience. I lived in Phoenix and then down in Orange County in California and I met a small town girl and she brought me home. Just the smaller community that makes you feel like when you go somewhere you know everybody. You know, the sporting programs, the uh, dance events, all these kinds of things you run into people you know and that, that care about you and your family. And that makes it just a wonderful place to have little ones like this. Isn't it time you found the balance you've been looking for? You went to County Utah. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking about the meat processing industry here in Utah. We left the last segment with uh, Dell mentioning the amount of time that he spends with a, with a cow on the ground from the time it, 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 it literally lands on the ground at birth uh, and, and that 18 to 20 month period there uh, or, or year period, six, seven months. How, how do you add the feedlot and meat processing time? So from, from first uh, arrival on the ground to the time it shows up on the shelf. Russell, what, what would that time frame be? Well, generally, when you're uh, feeding cattle, you want to get them in on feed as soon as they have enough size so that you're not uh, pushing them too hard. But generally, between 18 and 20 months is the time that they're ready for harvesting. And they would go to a harvest plant and be processed and end up on people's plates. Now, we had a chance, obviously, as you've seen in the show, to tour a small local plant. Uh, if, if it were up to federal regulation, would those plants be able to prosper in the state of Utah? Though the plant that you visited would probably be able to do that, but the bulk of the places that we provide inspection to would probably not survive a federal takeover. If the state of Utah lost its equal to status, to the federal and the federal came in and took over and that's happened in other states. Uh, what we would see is the federal give them a small length of time to bring some of the things that we work with them on. It doesn't affect food safety, but the facilities themselves. Many of our small operators would not be able to invest that amount of money in a lump sum to bring them up to what the federal would classify as being the plant that it should be. And so we would probably lose a third to a half of our smaller plants. Okay, well, so, so let me convert this over to the ranching side, Dell. Um, you know, somebody would probably say, well, why bother? I mean, we've got refrigerated trucks. So what if you have to send uh, the cattle to Texas or to uh, Kansas City for slaughter and, and have the product come back? The, you know, they've They've got refrigerated trucks that can leave us a cow and come back as a steak. Okay, right now, the truckers are charging $4 a mile to haul this beef. Whether it's dead or alive, that's still $4 a mile. And so you add that $4 a mile onto your uh, consumers who's going to pick that tab up in the end, the guy buying the, buying the beef in the grocery store. Uh, so, but it'd be a lot simpler because you take shrink. If I ship a herd of cows to Herbert, Texas, I'm going to take shrink on them cows because you don't have them on a truck for a thousand miles without them losing weight. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, on the hoof, I'm losing there. And so, uh, but if you had a, a pack plant close and had the, the market, uh, we could feed a lot of cat, a lot more cattle, right? Sevier County's got lots of farm ground. 
and Superior County's got some big feedlots, or could have. But uh, right now, they're shipping them other places in the feedlot. So you'd have another economy, right, local economy right there in Superior County, and Delta could do it uh, if you had a kill plant and a market for the beef after they killed it. That's the big thing is the market. Uh, we checked in this organic beef in the kill plant one time, and it just wasn't, the numbers wasn't there. So you, you're shipping your cattle to Texas currently? I'm shipping my kill cows to Texas. And, and how much does a, tr a load cost you? $4,000. How much do you make off of them? Uh, I can make, uh, I can still make $3,000 on a good load. So if I, if I didn't have to pay that freight, I can make $7,000. And $7,000 in my operation is a lot of money. To, to stay economically viable, our, our kill plants here in the state of Utah are having to go further out to bring them in, and that's a cost to everybody, the rancher, the, the kill plant, and ultimately to the consumer. Is part of that equation the fact that, that, that AUMs are being restricted and lost and we're actually losing the ability to produce cattle? I, I absolutely believe so. Uh, we have challenges, like right now down in Beaver and Iron County, the BLM is telling ranchers to plan on 40 to 50 percent cuts in their numbers uh, because they've allowed the horse uh, population to get out of control. So as they come in and say you're going to have to reduce uh, your, your, your grazing permit, that has a huge impact on cattle numbers and on the local economy, absolutely. We've lost a thousand cows out of the monument since it came into existence. Wow, that's quite a bit. Well, we're going to take a break. We'll come back for a conclusion of the show on the meat processing industry and cattle in Utah. Stay with us. It's been a very good conversation. It will continue to be when we come back. So, what brings you to town? What brings anyone to St. George? A couple rounds of golf, a little relaxation. What is that all? Is there more? In a retirement community? Should have stuck with the back nine. You go through the day-to-day -day repeating what you did yesterday. Don't you wish you could access that piece of your life that's missing? Find the beauty, serenity, family fun, or anything else that's missing from your life in the Cedar City Bryan Head area. Gain access to your adventure, whether it's camping, hiking, the arts, festivals, or just a getaway. Visit scenicsouthernutah.com for details on all the adventures that you can access in scenic southern Utah. Have you ever wanted to recreate the world around you? Add some excitement, culture, adventure? Well, there's no need to remake the world when that perfect combination already exists. Just remember four words. Welcome to Weber County. In Ogden, you'll find everything you're looking for, from the top of Powder Mountain to the restaurants of our revitalized downtown. Ogden, Utah. Mountain to metro and everything in between. Visit Ogden.com. Welcome back to the county seat. Meat processing and the cattle industry has been our conversation today. If you've missed it so far, go to our website, thecountyseat.tv. You can watch it all over again and share it with your friends on Facebook. Uh, it's a great conversation. I do want to I, I do want to just kind of wrap up by asking a question or an observation. For five years, I lived in Pennsylvania, so Utah boy goes away, and I I ran across quite a few cattle ranchers while I was back there. Uh, they don't need very many acres to uh, run a good cattle operation. Um, you know, 500 head doesn't take near what it takes to run out here in the West. Um, how does that play into the AUMs and the complaints that people have that say grazing on public land, they get it for pennies on the dollar? I'll just toss it out. Anybody want to answer it? Go ahead. Well, if, if you look at the, the, the resources here in Utah, uh, we're a grazing land state, and, and uh, if, if we don't have the ability to use those, uh, those, th those western landscapes and graze, uh, we don't really have any alternative. We don't have the private land with 70% or nearly 70% of Utah owned by the federal government. We're somewhat at their mercy anyway. And, and, and to use as an alternative going into a feedlot situation and, 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 uh, and, and feeding hay just is not economically viable. So it doesn't work. That's the quickest way to $15 a pound, or $15 a pound hamburger? It, it doesn't work for anybody, the rancher or the consumer, absolutely. Okay, I have allotment out there that's 200,000 acres. And they say I'm a welfare rancher. I have it's dirt roads. Uh, I have a line cabin in the middle of it. 
and it beats pickups to death, beats trailers to death, and it beats tires to death, and it's 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 hard. It's it's not it's not a, a good situation because you've got it any more. And these cows are my paymaster, and I've got to have a guy out there all the time taking care of these cows. We haul water, we move cows with water, and the expense is from my dad had a little cow outfit, and from what he he used to get by pretty reasonable. But for what I have to put into it, I've I've got. Uh, I've got a lot of money put up before I ever get my calves. I've got a lot of money put into these calves. And right now it's good, but everything else is up. Tires is up, fuel's up. So, uh, and then you got to deal with the federal government. You get people that has no clue what's going on out there. And, and in the monument, I'll give you a good example. The Estlany River was my allotment. Mine and my in-laws had it from Estlany to the lake, 75 miles. They got the cows out of there about the time the monument came in. And you can't even hike it now. That used to be big meadows. It was nice, it was a good ranch. And now it's just growing up with tamaracks, Russian olives, and willows, and the channels got deep, and the, the banks, is, uh, the grass banks is all gone, and you can't, even, you can't even hardly walk up and down that thing now. And it's only been 14 years, so what's it gonna be in another 20 years? It'll, it, that canyon's worthless. And that used to be a good ranch in that canyon. Russell, is, is that a, do you find that in, in a broader perspective across the state? Well, I, I think the thing that we need to take into consideration is managing that properties, grazing them has been proven to be more beneficial, better stewardship of the land than letting them go wild. We realize there's people that want wilderness and so on. I think we have enough of that in the state of Utah to satisfy people. The bottom line is the industry needs that in order to provide food. We take a, a major part in that is meat inspection to make sure that it's safe for the consumers. It's a partnership between everybody in order to make this work. Chad, let me add to that. Uh, we see every summer catastrophic wildfires. The best management tool that the government agencies that manage these lands can have on that is grazing livestock. They're, if they're managed properly, the lands are better served. You don't have the understory that ends up being a, a, a catastrophic wildfire that costs us in air quality, environmental impact, and dollars and cents. And you know what? Grazing off that forage provides meat protein that, that, that we all enjoy and at a reasonable price. You know, the part of the conversation that's happened today is relating to other topics that you have seen on the show. And that's what's so important about the county seat is that you have this opportunity to see how things that affect the state are related. As an example, during our conversation today, we talked about wildfires, and we recently had an episode on that, and the situation with wild horse management and its impacts on grazing. All things that have a critical effect on both urban and rural residents of the state. We thank you for inviting us in your home today to watch the county seat. We appreciate your comments. You can share them on Facebook and on Twitter. We ask you to like us and share us with your friends, and we will look for you next week on the County Seat. If you like this video, then we invite you to subscribe to our channel, The County Seat. You can do that here. And we invite you to share with your friends. We also invite you to get all the latest up-to-date information by following us on our social media channels. And if all else fails, make sure that you watch the county seat Sunday morning at 8.30 right here on ABC4 Utah.